Welcome everyone to Coffee with the Codex. My name is Doc Porter. I'm a curator in the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books and Manuscripts, University of Pennsylvania Libraries. I split my time with the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, which is a research and development institute that's in the Kislak Center. We study manuscripts sort of broadly defined. We have physical collections and we also have um, digital collections. We digitize all of our manuscripts. And I'm particularly interested in this line between physical and digital and sort of what happens when you digitize manuscripts and how it changes the way that we think about them. And Coffee with the Codex is kind of part of that. On one hand, it's a fun time for us to spend 30 minutes uh, looking at manuscripts, um, but it's also a chance for you to see a manuscript as a three-dimensional object in a way that you might not normally if you're just looking at them online. So uh, the manuscript that we are going to be looking at today is uh, shelf mark MS Codex 1056. And this is a book of hours, which you might have heard of, books of hours. They're pretty popular. Um, books of hours were a very uh, sort of common and well-known genre from, I guess, the sort of the 14th, but especially the 15th and into the 16th centuries. And they sort of petered out, I think, of popularity in the 16th century. Um, but uh, this one is from about 1475, and it is from uh, Rouen, France. And um, there's a few ways that we know that it is from Rouen, uh, and we'll talk about that as we, as we get into it. So books of hours are a very um, specific uh, genre of manuscripts. They were actually, um, the idea was to sort of take the, the, the kind of, um, religious practice that was, well, that, that was practiced in monasteries and convents by monastic people, by monks and nuns, and to convert it or translate it for lay, the use of lay people. So these were prayer books that, that were used by um, lay people, not, not by monks and nuns. And um, they were often owned because it was rich people, people who had money, who could afford to buy books, um, they were mostly um, used by uh, people who were sort of wealthy. And of course, there were social things happening during the, the 15th uh, century that, um, that led into this. So you had more people, sort of the growth of, I guess, the growth of the middle class, right? So you had more people with more money who could afford to buy books. And one of the ways, one of the types of books that they would buy were these books of hours. Um, and so this example, it was, we don't know the name of the person that the book was made for, but we know that it was for a woman. And um, I'll show you how we know that when we get to that point in the book. Um, the, the woman, it has been uh, suggested, may have been named Barbara. Why Barbara? Well, St. Barbara is on the cover. Now the cover here is not, uh, it's not original. So this was a 16th century, early 16th century cover. As I said, the book itself was made about 1475. So the cover is a little bit later. Um, we've got St. Barbara on the front and who was on the back? Let me remind myself who was on the back. Uh, John the Baptist on the, is on the lower cover. So we've got these nice um, boards with, uh, with, um, leather over them here. And you can see that there, there, at some point there were clasps, there were clasps here to hold the book, uh, hold the book shut. Those are sort of gone, but we have the remnants of them there. So that's a very nice cover. It's actually been, it's, it's really well um, maintained, I guess you could say, well maintained book. Um, and it was also um, used over time. So when I open up the cover, you can see that there is a uh, an, sort of an owner's uh, a book plate here and there are some notes, uh, owner's notes here. Let's see, I'm gonna take a look at the record and see um, what we know. So the, uh, the book plate is uh, Jacques Anibal Clara, pardon my French, uh, very literally, de la Tourette, uh, Léon, um, and this was between 1692 and 1776. So this was quite a bit later. Um, 
there is an inscription later on um, from Rouen in the 17th century. So we have ownership going back to the 17th century, which is actually a little bit unusual for books in our collection. Um, we also have a couple of other owner's inscriptions. So these are people who owned it, uh, owned it later. How did we get it? How did it come to pen? Well, we bought it from Sam Fogg in London in 2007. So at some point it got from these previous owners to, uh, to Sam Fogg. And that's how, uh, that's how we got it. So much like most all books of ours, uh, our book of ours opens with a calendar, uh, a calendar not in the in the modern sense exactly. You wouldn't you wouldn't use this calendar to make your meetings. What this calendar is is a um, I've heard it described as a map of the church year. So this is how you know which uh, saints to celebrate and what holidays to celebrate. Uh, during the church year. So we start out in January and the um, also the ways of determining the dates are a little different. The, you've got golden, the golden numbers, which are in this manuscript, literally golden. So if you've heard of um, beware the Ides of March, this is the kind of dating that we're talking about. So you've got the Ides and the Calends and um, that's how you're determining the date and then the saints for each day are lined up here. There aren't saints for every day and saints might be added um, at some later, later date. Now, typically in the books of hours, um, there are two sorts of illustrations that you're going to see. You'll be seeing um, the labors of the month which is sort of here is the kind of thing that you typically do during this month. Um, and then you're going to be seeing a zodiac. That is what you usually see in books of hours. In Rowan books of hours, you see something a little bit different. You will still see uh, labors of the month. So this is the labor of the month for February. And it looks like we have somebody sitting by a fire. That's a nice labor. I would like to do that. Um, but if we come over here, what you, we would normally see um, a zodiac uh, sign. This you would nor expect to see Aquarius here, um, but this is not Aquarius. This is um, John the Baptist uh, being, um, or, or I guess Jesus being uh, uh, baptized by John the Baptist. And so instead of the zodiac, what we're seeing here is is um, biblical scenes, which is typical, I don't know if it's typical for Roman books of hours, but you see it in, in Roman books of hours when you don't see it in others. And this is the point where I'm actually going to um, go to the Twitter thread that I shared earlier uh, with um, that Lisa Fagan Davis posted back in February because I had never seen um, anyone go through and explain why these particular biblical scenes were chosen for the Zodiac. And it's because there is sort of this more ancient tradition of aligning um, scenes and that. So what we'll do now is sort of go through and have a look and see what these are. So here we have, um, let's see the, let's see. So we already looked at this. We have the baptism of Jesus. Uh, instead of Aquarius. And then if I turn the page here, this is uh, Jonah and the whale in the place of Pisces, right? You've got fish, so you've got Jonah and the whale. Um, that is makes sense. And then here's our next labor of the, here I'm gonna rearrange my hoop. There we go. Um, there we go. So there we have Jonah and the whale. And then next we're going to have the sacrifice of Isaac for Ares. Um, so we have the ram there. So that's the connection with that one. And then we have, um, the next one is going to be uh, 
the um, Noah's Ark. Now this is for Taurus, which would be a bull. There is not, I think, a bull there in the image, but we can pretend that maybe there's one hiding, hiding back there. We have next, instead of Gemini, which is the twins, we have the creation of Adam and Eve. And so Lisa suggests that Adam and Eve are joined like twins. So that's why we have this twin connection. Um, the next one we have Jonah on the dung heap for uh, cancer. Not quite sure what the connection is there. There it is. Um, the next one is gonna be Leo, um, Leo in the lion's den. Or Leo in the lion's den, <laughs> sorry. Daniel in the lion's den, which is another sort of obvious, um, obvious connection there. And then uh, the next one is um, Virgo, the maiden, the assumption of the Virgin Mary. This is a neat connection between uh, Virgo and the Virgin Mary. Um, next is Libra, which is the balance. What we have here is Jod Judas accepting his gold, the idea that you have to use a balance to weigh the coins. And so that's the connection uh, here. We have um, for Scorpio, the scorpion, we have Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea um, as the Egyptians and Pharaoh drown. Um, why is this Scorpio? Lisa says, because there's a story somewhere about scorpions in the desert. So we have the desert connection with scorpions. Um, Sagittarius and the archer. This, um, this doesn't really have the usual connection. This is St. Catherine and her feast day, St. Catherine's feast day is here and she's in gold right there. So you can see St. Catherine, here's St. Catherine. Um, but Lisa says that um, the usual scene here is Absalom being shot, shot by an archer while caught in a tree. So there you've got the archery connection with Sagittarius. And then finally, Capricorn is the goat, um, which uh, shows a kitchen scene. So you can imagine the goat being slaughtered and, and eaten. So, there's, so there is our calendar. Um, so that's an, an indication that this is a, a Rouen Book of Hours because of the way that the calendar is set up. There are also a couple of um, Rouen specific um, saints in the calendar. So this is another way that we can we can sort of locate manuscripts is which saints appear. Um, there are the saints, here we go, St. Hugh in April. He only appears in, um, in Books of Hours for Rouen. So that's an indication there, St. Hugh. And St. Ostrobertha, who I had not heard of, but I love her name, Ostrobertha is in February. And she's... There she is there, St. Ostrobertha. So there's more indications that this is the Rouen Book of Hours. Now I'm gonna head back to the thing to see it. Let's see if there've been people chatting. Um, biblical from the New Testament, uh, mostly from the old, so mostly these were Old Testament, um, Old Testament um, alignments there. Uh, Kelly asks, has anyone identified the plants? I don't know. Um, this is very typical, the, we call them floriated borders is what they're usually called. Um, and and I, don't, I don't know how much work has been done identifying specific plants. I will say that this looks um, pretty, pretty typical for these, for, for books of hours at this period. And I don't know how, um, you know, how much the people who actually made them, if they were, if they were copying from other, things or how much they were actually looking at real life is a real, that's a really interesting question that I don't know the answer to. Um, Jacqueline asks, why were the signs of the Zodiac used in the first place? Simply to mark the passing of each month. I think so. So it's sort of an easy way to say, here's, you know, the month. Um, we've also, you know, even in the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at, at other medieval texts that are more sort of natural, both natural philosophy and, and scientific. Zodiac was like a huge part of the way that medieval 
people sort of thought about the world. So it was just, I think the Zodiac is just something that was, that was sort of there. So it, it wouldn't have been strange for them, I think, to have that. Um, let's see. Uh, William Campbell, if the text block dates to circa 1475 and the current binding is early 16th century, it implies that the original binding wore out at a fairly early date. Can anything be determined about the original binding? Damage to the upper corners might indicate it had been bound and carried as a girdle book. Oh, it could be. I don't know if anyone has has really looked at has really looked at that. It is it is interesting, I guess, that the the this binding is so close to the date of the manuscript, but isn't the original um, binding. So, um, so I don't, I don't know, but that's that would be an interesting thing to look at. And as Lisa points out, hi Lisa, <laughs> um, there are several other books of ours uh, that use the same series of biblical scenes. It's a really uh, interesting thing. And Kelly wants to see the saint for thirtieth of January. I will, I promise we'll get out of, we'll get out of the calendar, but let's go ahead and do that while we're here. So here's January. So at the very end of January, we have Anne and I don't know what, if that would be the 30th, but there we go. And there's, there's not one for the very end. So that's, um, there we go. Because there is there's actually more to look at. <laughs> this is this is a pretty neat, pretty neat one. All right. Um, next after the calendar, we have a page where somebody has written some stuff. 17th century is the date attached to this. So this was, you know, I say that we have um and it might actually be the owner's name here. We know that people were using this book up to the 17th century. Um, so there we go. So another Rouen uh, sign, and the, again, thank you to Lisa Fagan Davis for pointing this out, is this opening. Um, this is the text that this is, is um, <laughs> gospel lessons. I, I could have guessed that because here we have the four um, the four gospels, the four uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each pictured with their with their little animals. Um, and usually in books of ours, they each have their own, um, they each have their own portraits. In Rowan book of ours, they tend to be put together like this. So this is another sign that this is Rowan and not um, and not from somewhere else. All right. So here we have the gospel lessons. So these were sort of selections uh, from um, gospels. And I think they tended to be um, the same, although I will say I was, I was having a conversation with um, someone last week uh, named Catherine Kennedy, not, not the Disney Catherine Kennedy, but another Catherine Kennedy. And she was telling me that there hasn't actually been a lot of work on the text of, Books of hours themselves, uh, which seems um, like that's a thing that could be looked at. I think usually they're 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 looked at as artworks, which they're beautiful. You can see. Um, here we go. And as I page through, you can see again these floriated borders, and really nice illuminated um, initials. But there are more miniatures. Here we go. Here we go. So this is the um, Annunciation. The, uh, that is, here's uh, the angel Gabriel come to Mary to tell her that she is going to be having the baby Jesus. And in the margins, we have more sort of smaller miniatures that, that go along with that. So we have Adam and Eve being tempted by the serpent in the garden. And we have, let's see, what else is going on here? It's Annunciation, um, the meeting of Mary's parents at the Golden Gate. So this is Mary's parents meeting and the marriage of Mary and Joseph. So this is 
the story sort of leading up to Mary becoming this, the mother of God there. And there's also, because the book of hours wouldn't be complete without it. We also have some neat creatures in the margins too. So we have some kind of four-legged creature there. And then we have a bird here. And there's a lot of these. Um, there's a lot of these that we're going to be seeing through, uh, through this. Oh, come on. There we go. All right. Um, somebody, was it Kelly? I, I lost my place here. Yeah, the parchment is in incredible condition. It really is. It's really nice. Um, it's not the finest parchment. Um, it is, it's pretty thick actually, but, um, but the condition is really good and it's very nicely um, made. So the hair and flesh sides are not, it's a little bit hard to tell which is which, which is, to me is sort of one of the signs of nice, of nice parchment. When the hair side is so nice, it could be a flesh side, even though it's pretty thick. Um, there, let's see. Here we have Mary and Anne, I think. I get better with my, let's see. Um, we're on 34. Uh, yep, the visitation. Um, let's make sure that we get to all of these because I realize I spent a lot of time on that, on the calendar, which I thought was really interesting. But let's see, nativity. Angel and the Shepherds is 49. Oh wait, no, I'm skipping ahead too far. Nativity is gonna be on 45. There we go. There we have the nativity. And the roundels are shepherds with their musical instruments. And then this is the Tibertine Sibyl showing a vision of the child and virgin to Augustus. So that's sort of interesting. And we have another creature here in the margin and another bird up at the top. Um, let's see, 49, it will be our 49 verso. So here are the shepherds, I believe. Yep, the angel and the shepherds. And there, there they are playing their instruments again. And we have another creature down here. And a, it seems like every marginal, every margin gets a creature, a four-legged creature and a bird. That seems to be how the artist is, is figuring this out. Let's see, 52. Here we go, and here we have the Magi visiting Mary and Jesus. And these foriated, they are nice with the, with the flowers and the decoration. It's really uh, typical for these kinds of things. I haven't been looking at the, um, there we go. Let's see, what do we have next? 52, the presentation in the temple. Here we have the presentation in the temple. This one looks like he's trying to climb up. He wants to climb up and get into the, get into the picture. There we go. Flight into Egypt. So much. Here we go. Flight, in, flight into Egypt. And I am not sure. He seems to be either eating something or spitting something up. I'm not sure exactly what he's doing there. Let's see. Coronation of the Virgin. There we go. King David, uh, 67. Here we go, King David. 
and he has some roundels too. He has David and Goliath and the last judgment there. Let's see. Crucifixion. Let's go to the crucifixion 83 because this is No, so that's crucifixion. There was one more that I wanted to see before we, before we end, and it's towards the end. 114, so I'm gonna skip, skip ahead a little bit. Uh, 114, here we go. So I mentioned that we knew that this book was written for a woman. And the way that we are pretty sure of that is because she's in this picture. So this is really typical. This is called a, um, an owner's portrait. And in this particular scene and sometimes in other scenes, the owner is actually pictured alongside um, Mary and Jesus here. And so here she is. Um, dressed in sort of typical 15th century uh, dress. And she is, I'm not sure what, I can't read what she's saying, but she's got a little, um, a little ribbon there with some words on it. So this was a way for owners to sort of put themselves in, in, in the scene in a very literal way and like make themselves part of, part of the story. Um, and it's helpful for us as we as we look at it because sometimes it's a man and sometimes it's a woman and sometimes they're identified and so we can um, help identify. Um, you know, it helps us helps us with that. So that is that is her. Let me take one. Are there any last questions? Let's see. Uh, the ritually illuminated miniatures have facing pages. Um, I think they just. I think they would let it basically let it dry before they, um, before they bound them in. Sometimes, I don't think this one, sometimes if you look at the structure of the book, you'll find that the miniatures are single leaves that were very clearly painted separately and added. Um, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's just part of the choir and how exactly it was done. I, I'm not sure. That's a really interesting question. Um, is there a translation uh, online? There, I haven't really seen many translations of books of hours, but the texts, I mean, they're pretty well-known texts, so I'm sure that there are. Um, this one, I think it's mostly Latin, although there might be some French, um, some French in it. Usually it's Latin, the text is Latin with maybe some, some bits of French, um, although you get translations later into other languages. Uh, Lisa asks, does Obsecrete also use the feminine version? You know what, I looked, um, I, I didn't have a chance to look in the um, look at it myself, and the record is sort of silent on that. So you'd have to check to see. Um, Lisa's asking about the fe using the feminine version in Obsecrete. This is a, another way that you can see was it made for wo a woman or was it made for a man? Because the pronouns used in those prayers can be different depending. Um, Kelly, yes, why do you think her name was Barbara? So the idea is that because it, she, there's St. Barbara on the, the manuscript that maybe her name was Barbara, but it could have been a later Barbara or it could just be that somebody liked Barbara. So it's just sort of a thing. It's a kind of thing that you kind of guess at. So that's why the Barbara connection. Um, so yeah, so Lisa will check online about the Secrote. Okay, great. It's about... It's right about 1230. Um, oh, Heidi says St. Barbara was converted by reading scripture, patron of books. So it could just be, it could just be because um, because of the book, the book connection. So there we go. She's not, she's not named, like her name doesn't appear. Um, this, this owner, Barbara, oh, let's see. Here's the links. There's the links. Uh, hope we'll see you again uh, next week. Thanks very much. Take care.